We're talking gait, a uh, big, big topic in the alternative health and fitness community. Um, a lot of systems revolving specifically around it. We're going to talk uh, if maybe that's uh, the best of ideas, if it's a little overhyped, which aspects potentially a little overhyped or overtrained. Um, but first, like definitionally, when we think about gait, do you guys uh, do you guys define it as just the motion you would use to go straight forward, or is it the more so the motion that you use to like just travel around? So like walking backwards, that's gait. Like moving to the side to get out of somebody's way, that's gait as well. Or is like gait strictly like the forward, like you're on a treadmill, that's your pattern. So gait is controlled falling. That's where the term bracing finds any value is that your abdomen needs to brace the impact of the, the limb as it repeatedly. But I consider gait as anything that's the cyclical repeat uh, repetition of limbs as they exchange kinetic to reorient and or bring you somewhere. So if you're falling over and you're able to walk your feet back underneath you, if you're walking forward, if you're going backward, anything that projects your body by way of your, your limbs, mostly feet, we don't walk on our hands. But if you're climbing, sure. that would be a reciprocal. So would it be safe to say then that it's, that it's more of a, um, an individual expression of how you move around? Because that's, that's where it kind of sits with me. If, I, if we're talking about how it sits in, in my vocabulary and how it operates in my mind, um, gait for me is I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to box it into just forward locomotion for the sake of an argument on a social platform. So I'm looking at it from a, from an identity point of view. And I'm like, I can tell who somebody is. You can, you can put a hood over their head. You can put them at 200 yards away and I can tell you who they are based on how they're moving around, not just forwards, but in all directions. So for me, like I'm, I guess I'm, I, I use it in a much more broad sense, using it almost as a movement identity than just a single mechanic for us to, to break down. That's fair. That brings to mind rhythm and dance. Uh, that is included in gait as it is a rhythm is always, it should be priority. And I think the more centrally, uh, we'll talk about this, I'm sure at some point, but uh, the resounding nature of barrel reception or pressure reception or vibration to any degree is what our body hears. And although we get fixated on our senses, we have a plethora of sensory information feedbacking by way of our much more reflexive feet. So each time there's input data, we're collecting it. And depending on whether or not we allow it or we have constriction of allowance, we're gonna take in more of that data. But you'll notice that people that uh, have uh, restriction or stiffness often don't dance very well or they don't reticulate their limbs very well. And everything's correlated to the dance and freedom of expression. I think that's a great way to uh, expertise, like find an expertise in something, you practice dance in whatever you're doing. Yeah, so it's kind of, I mean, gait can be encompassed in like how somebody just moves around as a whole, how they kind of hold themselves when they're in motion specifically. Because if they're static, that's posture. If they're moving, that's some kind of gait, and you could you could cut it up into a bunch of different sections. Um, in terms of just like let's just uh, single it into just the forward, like I'm going for a walk, this is the main pattern I'm using, um, or I'm going for a run and I'm mostly going straight. Um, is that something that you want to focus on in your assessment of a client right off the bat? Do you think that that's like? It can be very contextual. Like if somebody obviously has trouble walking, then you might want to spend more time on it. If somebody's coming in with a shoulder, are you super concerned about their gait then? Um, what's kind of your guys' framework for that? Yeah, I'll have uh, Tony, I guess, go into more detail or in depth about what I'm about to describe. But there's a nervous relationship in everything. And our brain is literally just traveling itself and becoming cognizant through it's the body to feature itself more physically. So it's not just an idle fixture or organ. So whenever we can communicate through our specific points, there's always a feedback loop through the other limb or the opposite limb. This guy, this, that is the left side is sensorily operated uh, in coordination with the left side limb. So shoulder and hip on the left side are gonna be 
cognizant of the same sensory information. And then uh, the opposite mechanical feature is going to be happening in the opposite limb. So like right shoulder, left hip, they're going to be doing the, uh, like one's going to be coming toward the other and they're going to be uh, reci uh, reciprocating each other. Uh, but they have a mechanical relationship where this the same side has a sensory relationship. So anytime that you're moving in space, you are effectively twisting your spine to leverage the motion. And the more coordinated people that move through space walk with much less instability of that, that cross coordination. It looks very seamless. It doesn't seem like they're doing a whole lot because there's a lot of muscle featuring the stability or the bracing, the neutrality of it. Uh, but uh, like I was saying, the cross coordination of neural connection that the brain communicates through uh, the nervous system and justifies the relationships of motion, not just in that they're expected to do that, but they have a neural reception of if they're not doing that, there's going to be something that's not doing something in the likely. Yeah, I mean, this is something that shows up um, and, and it's something that as a trainer, once you understand um, the opposite limb connection <laughs> and you start to see where those things manifest, it can make you look like a superhero to clients that don't know any better. They, um, they're blown away when they, they walk in and they say, my hip's been really bugging me. And I go, that's interesting. How many times a day are you holding your phone on that side right there? And they go, how the hell do you know that? And it's like, it's part of it is repetition. How many times we've seen it. But part of it is the fact that you can't not see them walk into the clinic. You can't not see them walk up to the coffee table when you're meeting them for coffee for your initial consult. Like there's a lot of things that once these things are in your toolkit, you don't have to go and turn them on. They're just on all the time. So people watching becomes infinitely more interesting because you're seeing all these expressions. You're just like bad footwear, this, this, like, and it's fun. You're just theorizing. But at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're constantly perceiving where people are holding these strange tensions. So in terms of a gait analysis, I'm not looking at it in terms of um, forward gait being, um, I'm, I'm comparing forward gait to an ideal in my mind. I'm looking at your forward gait in terms of how are you expressing this in terms of ease, in terms of confidence, and in terms of functionality? Like, do you have to shut down a certain part of your body to make gait happen? If you do, there's nothing that, that you should be ashamed of. But there's a starting point for figuring out what that mapping is. And I think that, that gate, once you understand um, that gate is like the, the overall map, for me, it's like a, an overall, uh, like a, a quick 20 point inspection of a vehicle. It gives me a starting point. And that's, that's effectively how I use it. Um, it's not a set up and go for a walk with me. Just uh, walk down here and walk back for me. People know when you're doing a gate analysis. So that's not really how I'm using it. For me, it's more like I'll have them go and grab a piece of equipment from a, a, across the room or I'll have them do a different drill and I just watch how they walk one side or the other. And that'll determine whether their stress is too high and we need to pick something different or if they look bored and their walk looks unchallenged and they're not stable and nothing's forcing them to be stable, then they're not challenged enough. So, I mean, it's, it's a great temp gauge to carry throughout all of your training. Do you as well get them running in the assessment if you think it's uh, it's warranted? Uh, warranted as in like an athlete or someone who regularly runs? Yes. Otherwise, yeah. no. And it's not really an assessment protocol for me. I, I, that's only in the condition. It's for sure not an assessment for me. Uh, it's only on the condition that someone asks to improve something they are already in practice of and they confirm they do it out of pain. Yeah, I don't, I don't use running as, a, as an assessment. I'm not a running coach. Um, I don't have a particularly strong running stride myself. So I'm not in a position <clears throat> to critique something that's out so far out of my wheelhouse, A, and B is so far out of cognitive function. The, the more effort we put in, the less control we have behind the controls. You're not piloting everything you're doing. The faster you go, the more autonomous it gets. So it, for me, I stay out of that because I'm like, I don't, I don't know how to drill that in at this point. Like I have smarter people in my network I can send people to if there's a problem. But what I'm finding is that um, I'm more interested in how your performance 
or your expression changes after that run or after that sprint? Um, are you walking differently because you're tired from the run or are you walking differently because you're hiding something now? Or did that run open something up? If the other stuff is taken care of, your specific sprint gate is going to be yours. It's not for me to critique how you're doing it. That should be autonomous based on what your body's built like and, and what your needs are. But if something hurts, we got to go after it. Then we were just talking about uh, basically is a gate like a big part of your initial assessment when you just like meet somebody for the first time in terms of just yeah. like how they walk towards you or like in terms of setting them up on the treadmill and getting them to, to go up to their max speed or whatnot. Do you uh, use that in your assessment at all? I would say you use it as a byproduct more after the fact because seeing the way that someone moves, like the way that they walk, walking is a pattern that you probably perform more than anything. So it's a great, I would say, like gives you good disclosure as to what the person's working with, what they're dealing with, what they're hiding, what's working well, what could be a little bit lacking. But as far as like, I absolutely must see their gait, um, it's not that high of a priority because... Hmm. it's different like for me for example my right foot is legitimately an inch to an inch and a half bigger than my left foot so that means that I'm going to have express mechanics that differ from one side of my body to the next so if I have like a controlled rubric for example looking at someone like myself I'm not going to see something that's going to be that honest of a depiction and I'm going to have to look with a more fine-tooth comb gotcha so when you're uh, looking at somebody's gait, are there some like real obvious red flags? Um, and if in the case you think it needs to be brought to their attention, like they're in pain and you can see that, oh, there's something in the way that they're landing, mm -hmm. then maybe do you bring it up to them? Or is that something where you're like, okay, I don't really want you to focus too much on like how you're applying the stuff to your walking like intentionally, I wanna kind of drill it and then hopefully it changes uh, more automatically. Say a good indicating factor is like if the hips are pointed forwards. It's like if the hips are forwards and the shoulders are forwards, you're gonna have a healthier time. Like that's something that I will look for in each person and be like, well, are you walking and they're kind of going like this and are they swiveling to where the way that the body is designed in an optimal state if you're moving forwards your energy is supposed to be traveling forwards so if their hips are kind of like pointing out here and they're too duck footed well you're going to be wasting energy right you're not going to get that good of a natural press off to where if your hips are kind of facing forwards in your shoulders you can tell that you're going to have a healthier gait because the energy is not being wasted in like trying to do this and try to do that and couple around a bunch of things where <laughs> walking is supposed to be very efficient and effective for us. <laughs> so if you had somebody who is a little swivelly, like you said, um, mm -hmm. would, you bring, would you bring their attention to it? Would you, like some people might film them and be like, here's how you're walking, let's, let's change this. Uh, some people, yes. Like some people it's so bad that it's like, okay, we got to look at this right now because if this is your like 10,000 steps a day pattern, all the work that we do away from that is going to be pulled to the side and it's going to get in the way because that walking is just going to keep walking you out of the good work that we're doing. So for someone that's like red flag, red flag, yeah, number one on the list. But for other people, if, if it could just be cleaned up a little bit, I don't, I don't say I would film it and show it back to them because then they're going to start like, self-policing themselves and like really get down on themselves but what I would do is look at the whole system holistically and oftentimes there's usually a tell or some kind of like splinter in there that contributes to the walking thing so if you buffer them holistically sometimes the gait pattern without direct addressing will refine itself Tony, what about you? Any like red flags that you've seen pop up quite a bit and how would you kind of go about starting to address them? Um, I always start with what they want to address first. And that's, this is, um, this is really a, an issue of uh, giving them advocacy in what they're doing. If we want things to actually change, they need to initiate that first change. So if they want, if they're coming to me and they say, I want to move better, I say, that sounds great. Is there a particular part of your body that you want to move better? Is there something that's working really well one side to the other? Or is there a certain part of your body that you're like, my knees have always been bad and I just want to have better knees. 
they can usually drive you to what's causing them discomfort or causing them dysfunction. And then from that point, um, it's not necessarily that you have to deal with the site of the pain, but that's the, that's where you take care of the loudest alarm first, you know, and, and that's where you earn their trust. And like Ben said, if you can take care of the thing that's nagging them out of being in that flow state of being allowing their body to express itself in its unfettered way, if you can get them to that spot, maybe that gate stuff corrects itself. Maybe they start walking more fluidly and suddenly they gain an inch in their height and they go, why does it feel better to be taller right now? And I go, I don't know, maybe you just unstuck something. We don't have to necessarily take credit for it either. But, um, but I think it's important to take care of the, of the, the, the loudest alarm first so that we can bring them into that state of um, where they're actually at with their, with their gait. Um, Cause a lot of people, if there's a red flag, like a uh, hiked shoulders or wincing in the eyes, I watch the corners of the eyes a lot. Um, people who have back pain and they've had chronic back pain for a long time or they get very good at not going, <sighs> getting in and out of the car. But what they'll do is they'll end up with crow's feet because they, they micro wince all the time and it's every time they move so it's not that i want to draw attention to it because i don't want to make them self-conscious of it but for me it's something that i might put in my notes so that if something changes and they go hey this thing that was bothering me is no longer bothering me maybe i check back on those little twitching in the eyes now and if the eye twitching is going down we're making progress so you don't necessarily ascribe to the idea that they're misbehaving by taking a certain path and trying to whip them into performing the right pattern? I think there's lots of, there's lots of ways that you can try and do that. Um, something that had come up in a, a conversation probably better than a year ago now, it was a, a, a group chat conversation. And Ben and I were, this was where I first breached the term uh, motion data to Ben. And I, I feel like I earned his trust at that moment. And what it was, is I said, um, you can show them what you think the perfect rep is and the perfect geometry based on what you think their bone length is and rhythm and all that stuff. But effectively they're going to do that rep and then they're going to do one degree in each direction and then one and a half degrees in each direction and every single variation in each direction. And the one that feels efficient and gives them the most power with the least amount of input is the one they're going to do. So <laughs> that's what you're working with. And the more data you get, the clearer that image becomes. Mm -hmm. Nathan, red flags for you when you see somebody's gait? Uh, stiffness. I just look for anything that's not allowing. I, I, I want to see a body that's permissible. I mean, if we're, th we're talking about the same thing, perspective of falling each time you step, if time is a crash landing, so to speak, how is it that your body allows for force to enter it? without you also at the same time feeling like you have to deal with that force and it doesn't get dealt with. So how Ben was talking about, a lot of the stuff handles itself. When you start to upregulate midline behavior, all that undercurrent, all that uh, nervously contextualized uh, organ space, and then the inside of your ribs and then your throat and then your uh, nose and your ears, everything that communicates as a byproduct of how your brain most effectively asks itself how it's doing, what it's doing, and uh, to do whatever else. Um, when that starts to upregulate, all the behaviors of the limbs starts to become a lot more uh, uh, synergistic. And it's just a byproduct of force reception and permission. So um, how you fall is not always a thing, but how you get up and then how you deal with yourself after you've fallen. Do you hold on to that and limp around? And do you indicate to your brain, there's an injury here I need to take care of uh, without actually having us inspect it or assessed it? Like there's a measure of like kids when they fall down, they get back up and the parents wait to see how the kid assesses their own injury. That's a fundamental facility of human beings. We don't just lose that when our parents go away. So if you've fallen down, if you've hurt yourself, if you tweak yourself, unless you hear a percussive like pull or tear or you've broken something and you cannot put weight on something, explore it a little bit. Test it. 
Yeah, it was an interesting experience um, doing some of the gate work with you, Nathan, because I was already very gate conscious or conscious, you would say. Um, I had a lot of preconceived ideas about what the optimal mechanics were, and I was kind of trying to, to tailor them and, and create them. Um, it involved a lot of the kind of reciprocation that comes with like the, the falling and the, the torquing of the spine one way or the other, but it wasn't a, a result of like the force that was being generated or applied to my body. It was more so a, like a top down thing that I was doing because I thought it was correct. And I did, when I started thinking about it, as soon as I thought about, oh, my rib cage is a driver for my legs. And I started thinking about using that reciprocal motion. I could tell like, oh, I'm feeling my obliques help me take a step. Oh, when I go hiking, I'm not as tired. So there was some benefit to it, but I think it just got taken a little too far where it was so much thinking through the motion and not enough feeling or just like, like more so uh, prioritizing the reaction or the relationship between myself and the ground um, as opposed to just myself, this part, this part, this part, this part, this part. Um, and you, your stuff kind of helped bring me again into that more midline dominant behavior where it was just about kind of maintaining the heaviness, the feeling, and then uh, sensing how the weight transfer side to side would take me out of neutral, but I didn't have to take myself out of neutral as much. Is that, do you think that's kind of like on the right boat in terms of how you would think about uh, somebody who again is overthinking their gait, them trying to come out of that pattern? Yeah, I mean, if you just explain the base, like uh, the fundamentals of what's happening, there's so much happening that there's no way someone can consciously or proactively think about what's happening in the moment. So to make that a little simpler, if you're moving one muscle, you're firing one muscle, you're to a degree inhibiting the opposite side of things. So as to allow for more action of that muscle you're using. So there's going to be a uh, reflexive behavior to offset as when when people say there's posterior driven and there's front side driven in order for you to have those considerations it's like what's happening on the front of the body has to either be mitigated or handled by the back of the body if it's not also happening on the back of the body so it's just like you can't go so far over that the rest of your body just comes with it you still need to stay grounded you still need to like stay upright uh, so uh, when you're taking a step, you're walking into muscle that's preventing that bone from going too far. And you have to learn how to keep some awareness on what too far is. And the farther your foot takes a step, the longer your leg reaches. So unless you're good at keeping that limb stiff, you're not going to be strong at that far reaching uh, uh, fulcrum. It's going to be weaker because it's so far out. And so people like to tuck their pelvis and pull from their stronger points to be able to get themselves back to upright and we'll justify motion, however, which way we will. But if we're not doing it with cognizance, uh, or if, we're our, if we're doing it with so much cognizance, we're going to end up doing things that restrict our behavior as opposed to if we build out the reflexive nature of things, it's, you can't think in terms of how it, uh, what's happening you have to think in terms of how it feels because you're turn you're taking in sensory data you're taking in how ben describes it motion data your brain is literally consuming information based off of the skin based off of the pressure based off of the impact force the heat the speed of your heart the uh, increase of noise whatever it may be all that stuff is communicating to say am i safe right now am i doing something well are all these things fundamentally working in sequence? And then there's a order of hierarchy. So if you don't have enough unconscious behavior already inundated and you're trying to keep telling yourself, I have to do this as well as this, as well as this, and your body hasn't built out to be inherently reflexive because reflexes are not something you think they happen. And so the doctor will test your reflexes. It's not a quality of I was born with bad reflexes as much as I didn't do enough to keep my reflexes alive. And so in that relationship, uh, you need to just build out the body and then learn how to uh, move from a body that feels its information and then tells the brain what that means. And the, uh, tells the brain and the brain disseminates it for itself. You brought up one of the topics that I wanted to get to, which has essentially been termed forward gear versus reverse gear. 
and there's certain people saying that uh, this group who I think the the whole thing is like their hips are in front of the ribs or whatever that's forward or that's reverse gear and then if you go the other way you're more back chain right and that's forward gear. oh I didn't even think about that I didn't even understand it to be totally honest I thought it just meant front side of the body back side of the body but that makes kind of sense like you're shifting forward and you're shifting back I think so like Ben do you do you have you heard of that term before and do you think there's some like truth to it <laughs> talking about like what front chain back chain dominance i guess that, I, that... like less about that and more i guess the four gear versus the reverse gear and some people being okay. stuck in reverse <laughs> so the bind, it's that binary concept right that's the one you're asking here <laughs> yeah. oh man <laughs> um i don't know like my understanding of the way that the body works is that everything is like active force and opposing force to facilitate the active force. So like there's passive force and active force. For example, if I'm walking, my right leg and my left arm are connected and they work together. And then there's opposing force from my right arm and my left leg. And then we alternate and we scissor when we walk. So <laughs> if you're ever doing anything in like, I don't know, forward gear there's going to be reverse gear activity to facilitate the the forward movement and then there's always going to be stuff going on in the front of your body that is facilitating moving backwards so <laughs> that's my understanding is very like cut and dry a and b so i kind of laugh at this stuff like front chain back chain i'm like well you couldn't have a chest if you didn't have a back and you couldn't have a back if you didn't have a chest so it's like fighting for <laughs> one or the other you always lose <laughs> <laughs> good marketing hey like well, you know, somebody hates for me it's like your, I, stuck in your front chain bro you're stuck in your reverse gear we need to ship you out of that tony take it away <laughs> it's a it's an interesting concept um to kind of drive shame into whoever is being recoded right the idea that you would be driving around in reverse gear is absurd but they're going to repeat it until you believe it and that's the part that's whack about it. Um, you can't go forward in a reverse gear. You're just driving your car backwards, right? And it's like, that's just dumb. It doesn't make any sense. Going into the ribs over hips thing, um, these guys will post still shots of people running forwards. And they're like, see, the ribs are in front of the, they're in front of the pelvis. But the knees are at 90 degrees because the guys are about to hit somebody in a football game. I'm like, yeah, dipshit. He's moving forwards. How the fuck are you moving forwards with your ribs behind your hips? <laughs> if you're not sliding down a hill, please tell me. Like, the only time that, that your hips are in front of your ribs is sliding into a base in baseball or sliding as a quarterback or a kicker. That's it. So the, the idea that this is reverse gear, forward gear, is, is, uh, it's a false, it's a false uh, dichotomy. And, and we're getting stuck into it with the idea that um, if I lean forwards and my ass and my hamstrings take more of the load during running, then I'm back chain dominant because those muscles are doing more work. But what's happening is you're offloading and keeping your hips collapsed. You're keeping your quads offloaded and you're, you're putting your system out of whack. Yeah, you're going to get stuck that way because your, your psoas is going to shorten up and you're going to get stuck with duck butt. But don't worry, there's a clan of people out there that are going to tell the world that you're right. And if that's fine, then if that's good with you, bro, then good. That's great. But to create this false narrative and then get people fighting about it using inflammatory language, no backing, no video proof of forward or reverse gear. I've never seen them post anything that says, this person is reverse gear watching a video. It's always a still shot. So I'm like, I'm, I'm over here with my arms in the air being like, I'm just not even going to participate in that one. I'm out. Forward chain, reverse chain, back chain, two chains, whatever, man. I don't care about that one. <laughs> I think they're seeing behaviors. I think they're trying to contextualize things that they don't know the words for. And it makes sense, like, because they don't have understanding that there are words to describe what behaviors are being seen, they put language to it. 
And because it's so much easier to simplify, and we're talking, I mean, truthfully at this point, uh, we're talking about Godot with respect to the recoding and telling about the back chain. We're talking about flowability. And I think uh, I think there are a number of other things similar. There's there. offshoots. Uh, yeah, there's offshoots and derivatives. Yeah. Um, Same shadows though. Yeah, at end of day, the thing that people are misunderstanding uh, is that the core, the fundamental midline, the thing that uh, we're, that I keep referencing is a neurological term to describe the behavior of like the most neurologically connected or neurosensitive or neuroavailable parts of the physical body. So starting with like the face, that's your most sensitive along with your, uh, your groin. And uh, as you take more attention to, so like Wim Hof, for example, I don't even have to show you what a belly is. You guys know what a belly is. I think I'm, I'm in session doing a Zoom right now. Um, when you get the pressure to uh, equivocate past your esophagus and you start to build that fundamental heat in the belly, the belly starts to engorge and get bigger, kind of like the dad bod sensation, but it's more like a barrel body. So becoming more cylindrical and it frames like a, uh, a barrel. Uh, but what happens more significantly is that the ribs start to distend or rather they come downward and they uh, become more long separate each other and so the intercostals the muscles between them start to build out heat and it's like a kind of an insulary like a, a blanket or an insulary uh, um, sweater or whatever and Wim Hof has had a couple of studies done on his clinical uh, clinical studies done on his uh, his breathing practice where he's been uh, inoculated or put with some uh, um, a virus a virus exactly and uh, he was able to uh, essentially beat it in a 24 hour period or whatever. And in the same, he can go into the ice and not have the effects of cold. And so there's a whole movement around how can we tolerate this stuff? So the fundamental thing that he's done is that he's built out enough musculature between his ribs and enough comfort in becoming sleeved. So his organs are always thermo thermoreceptive. They're always like contained within a unit that allows for them to know how and where they are. So there's always a sleeve around the visceral body. And so the organs are protected. And that means more oxygen is going down to the organs, less oxygen to the brain. And so he has a higher CO2 threshold. His body is governant over the oxygen saturation. So instead of him just burning through fuel in his brain, his body is starting to induce that effect of like the heat, the pump, the visceral coordination. And so he's built out uh, some physical parasympathetic tolerances or qualities that if they were just a little bit more structured, they'd be way more supportive of a calm, tolerant nervous system. But instead, he does the dragon breath or the really intense, uh, heavy, heavy like movement of it. And he gets you really inflamed, even though breathing is an inflammatory process, you put an extra amount of oxygen there. So it doesn't really teach you how to saturate oxygen. It teaches you how to super saturate oxygen. So it's probably going to oxidize you if you're not living in a, I'm running all the time or doing whatever. It's still not a good way to breathe. Generally not a good way to breathe. It's just a way for you to condition heat into your system really quickly if you don't know how to do it on your own. But your vagal nerves are what should conduct that heat because it's your brain's capacity to communicate to that viscera. If you cheat it, you're going to just have a quick high from it you're not going to have the lasting impression of loaded midline, which is <clears throat> speaking from a volume, like you can project a little bit easier. I was just like attending to some of my own midline behaviors, like my pelvic floor. If it's not underneath me, if it's tucked, then everything in accordance is going to be to a fashion tucked. So all the things from butthole to mouth hole are midline. And if you do not know how they coordinate together, there's going to be some offshoots of uh, coordination that don't work for your brain super well. And you can get away with moving around that. Um, and there's some of the, the things or the ideas that I want to get to here that I think are an offshoot of that. Uh, one of them being the idea that the gait cycle starts with your hands, that kind of the motion that you would do, say like holding a, a weight and doing this, 
this motion is a large driver for everything else. Um, and you're kind of trying to like vortex yourself so fast with your arms that your body and your legs um, go with that. Um, I think there might be some, some truth to that, with, that it might just happen. Like there's a recoil that happens, but I don't necessarily think that when you're running, you should be trying to operate your hands the fastest. You should probably just be trying to move yourself the fastest. Um, Tony, I know you have a lot of experience kind of like training the hands and experimenting with different hand positions mm -hmm. with running. What are your thoughts on that? Um, my thoughts on that are that I played the role of Icarus when it came to the hand stuff and I flew too close to the sun. And it got to a point where I was so hand aware that it was distracting me when I was running. So it was like, what are my hands doing? Oh, my hands are, are warm now. Oh, my hands are cold now. Oh, this, this, this. Like, I was perverting the data that I should have been processing by putting too much emphasis in a sensory organ, which we have to remind ourselves, it's what our hands are when we're running. They're sensory organs that give us safety, they give us perception, and give us feedback, right? So it's like, yes, they're actionable as, as sports items or as you know humans with opposable thumbs, sure. But in the, in the context of, of gait and um, whether it initiates with the hands, I reform my positions. There are certain hand positions that in the short term do feel good. Uh, when you try them out, you might make, might make you feel lighter. It might even give you a faster time. The question is, is it sustainable? And is it really the issue or is it showing you where the issue is? So it's like, is it, is it actually fixing the problem or is it just saying, here's the patch. So here's how I'm gonna bypass this burnt out fuse. I'm gonna put a jumper wire across hey the lights are the lights are on again right on what does that tell us it tells us the fuse is burnt out it doesn't tell us to use the jumper wire full time and that's where that's where i've reformed my position on on hands with running is uh i was i was very interested in how much input i could i could tap into using the hands to give myself better movement patterns and what ended up happening was uh it was too big for my britches it was way too much information. So uh, I've reformed my position back to being task oriented. And uh, I believe that your motion, uh, your motion starts in your midline. That's it's, it's starting with your center mass. You might think about moving and really it starts mentally first before you move at all, even reflexively, you're still perceiving your environment. Um, but your, your hands might twist, but there's still an initial something that has to move in that midline um, for everything else to react. The, the tail doesn't wag the dog in my opinion. And I, and I think Ben would probably know that just from uh, running with a football, because if you have one side that's much more limited and you can't whip it around at its distal end, um, it, it's, not, it's not like you end up just turning one way and running in a circle. <laughs> You're able to calibrate yourself and then like make it so it's still a, a very efficient motion and you in that scenario have to be much more adaptable even than uh, just going for a run yeah that's a, that's a different animal like what people are doing right now in the gym is like they're experimenting they're playing with ideas but i would say maybe a pitfall is that the ideas aren't being tested in a high fire scenario it's uh, it all sounds good and it's perfect in a perfect fair weather setting, flat ground. Everyone's got shoes on, you know. Everyone believes the the information, but they're not taking that concept and testing it. So that's the fun part about having the ability to play a sport is that it's not always going to be at your own pace. You don't get to count your breathing and think about your hands all the time, whatever else, because one you have a goal oriented uh, task. And then also you have enemies and people that are trying to take you down. So the way that you're utilizing all these different concepts now changes because it's like war. So like anyone could agree in that how you move and what you do on a fair weather day when nothing is happening, is going to differ when shit hits the fan, your back's against the wall and you got to find out, okay, what I choose to do here impacts my survival rate. And then all of a sudden, it's a completely different story. So playing around with these different techniques, and like Tony was mentioning, task-oriented, you actually start to find out, at least for yourself, what's actually efficient and what actually works, 
when the bullets are flying versus just like running an objective scientific test without any challenging things to the data, you're not going to come out with uh, a truthful concept. You're going to come out with a fair weather concept that hasn't faced testing. And then I feel like that would be something that could benefit all the ideas this is like, put it through the ringer. It's like you create a new prototype or a new piece of technology. You don't work out the kinks as it goes is if you're a smart company, you work out the kinks in house and be like, all right, let's put it through water. Let's put it through fire. Let's blow wind at it and see if it actually holds up. So I feel like a lot of the ideas, they sound fantastic and it's got a nice little bow on it, but they don't really test the shit out. So then a lot of people are left to test it out themselves and find out the, the legitimacy. And if there is it. Yeah, that actually brings to mind. <clears throat> I did try out a number of the systems that I have uh, an opinion over. I had a uh, client friend or a guy on Instagram that I paid to run me through Goda when it had first popularized as far as I had seen. And uh, I'd been interested in it uh, before I had come in contact with, uh, uh, I think that it was soon after I'd come in contact with some neurology that I was like, oh, wait, that, that just doesn't make sense then. And it was the, <clears throat> I think it was the homunculus stuff. It was just so, so much physical behavior in the hands and feet. But then in the same, I was like, oh, another person's doing this. Weck was doing some hand and foot stuff. And I was very interested in learning about that. And I, that's where I met Chris from S10 Fitness. And that's where I got my uh, hands on brain stuff. Uh, but truthfully, dude, uh, kids are the facet of quality motion because they don't have uh preconditions of what might go wrong and a uh, flurry of um, like explanations for why they it won't go right again so like kids are either experiencing something sensorily for the first time wherein they don't have a uh, an experience of if i don't like this i can just not do this there's some things that they have to fundamentally build out so that their brain can feel equilibrium and if they don't get that, then they're going to be at a deficit because, for example, babies, their heads are what, a third of the size of their body, like majority of their weight or majority of their fundamental mass. And if you try to fund, if you try to compare gait and analyze your motion relative to a baby, one, <laughs> it's nonsense. It's, it's just absolute nonsense unless you're a victim of serious neuropathy and you're coming out of a coma like and that's no disrespect if you're coming out of a coma you should definitely do some stuff that's more infantile yeah if pick you're up the five out of five, a coma, yo. <laughs> <laughs> sorry the pick up a workshop tool if you're coming out of a coma right get now. with the program um one of the things that i think uh, happens in the crawling cycle Shoot. that people have adopted for uh for gait is the head over foot idea um, the idea that there's with the weight shift, with the fall, that your head needs to land right over in order for you to be in a true balance or, or whatever. Um, what do we think about that idea? I was just thinking about that the other day. I think that Weck has a compelling argument for it, just in that the way he moves in it is so smooth and it intercorrelates with a lot of the stuff that he does. But the reality of it is your head is the thing that you're trying to move around and then your organs your feet are not the thing so you don't want to place the priority things over the foot you want the foot to be underneath your your mass and you want that to be correspondent with how your spine is loading into the ground and if it's doing something where it hiccups forward or if you're accenting the curvature of it say you're pushing your chest out or you're pushing your butt out both of those things uh, they're going to hamper your ability to receive force downward. So if you don't have a lot of muscle mass, uh, that would be why uh, those parts ache. If you do have a lot of muscle mass, uh, then they're probably moving too much and you're not stable enough in that area. But both those things need to construct around a stable spine because that's pelvis and that's ribs. Yeah, the, um, the head over foot thing is a it's a very interesting carrot when you've not been introduced to the concept. That's actually what drew me into WEC in the first place to even look at WEC method beyond um, 
you know, just kind of seeing it in passing. The only reason I stopped scrolling was the head over foot thing. And when you're standing static, it's a very easy thing to demonstrate because you do have better balance when you're, when your head is, or when your foot is underneath your head. But that's the difference is like Nathan said, it's your foot underneath your center. It's finding your center. But what he's done is he's found a way to uh, give a different point of view to achieve that balance in a still standing position. He's giving you a reference point of your head and your foot instead of orienting how it feels. He's giving you some instruction and it works. But that's fair. something that I mentioned to David and to, to Chris Chamberlain when I visited WEC Method in 2019 is that I recognized after about one day of really watching a lot of WEX wacky videos um, was that this is what happens when you get tired. When you tire running a set of stairs, you go head over foot. You collapse at 45 degrees to your lead foot. It happens every time we fatigue. And what we're doing is we're leaning into our joints because we're leveraging emergency limp patterns. And that's what this is. Is, is it efficient? Yeah, but it's also limp mode. It's kind of like, <laughs> it's a spare tire, right? So you have a donut in the trunk and you use it when you need it, but you only use it to get to the service station to fix the flat. And that's really what this head over mechanic, head over foot mechanic, this ex especially the exaggerated lean, that's how it starts to sit in my mind is that it's there to save you when you're too tired to save yourself. But that doesn't mean that we should be leveraging it being like, look, we should use it all the time. It's peak efficiency. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's inefficient. And, it, and like Nathan said, it, it's moving your head around to a point that there's a, there's excessive mobility and excessive motion through um, the most critical part of our neck. And I don't think that we should be hypermobilizing the base of the skull if we don't need to. I think you're also hypermobilizing the rib cage when you're thinking about the coil or just uh, the lateral line shortening on one side and lifting on the other side. And that's something that I did a lot with a lot of like corrective exercise that I learned was that you're trying to get this like big stretch on one side, this nice contraction here, maybe without going too far into it, but trying to keep some balance between the two. And part of your locomotion was driven by this like exchange and recoil where you're just wagging yourself. And there was a, a, a hill sprint that I posted like sometime last year that the biomech group chat that I wasn't a part of like was roasting me for and, and then sent me the video because I was like just like doing all this sideways motion to get up the hill. And it was something that I uh, started to not only um, realize I was doing so much of this, but also like the turning uh, and the idea of like getting this max rotation one way, this max rotation the other way. Uh, I realized when I was like shooting around playing basketball that when I was going to the rim, I couldn't go in a straight line. I had to do some kind of curve. Or I had to do some sort of like wagging. Yeah. And, that, and that's like a, a useful motion. You should have access to that. But I should be able to go straight pretty easily, or at least that should be the, the neutral of my gait. I shouldn't always be coming over myself. And, and it makes total sense what you said in that it is like kind of efficient in a way but it's, it's got a very low ceiling in terms of like your power output, I think. Ben, would you, would you kind of agree with that? Have you tested head oh. over foot? <laughs> Abs are fucking loopy, man. Oh, man. Ugh. I feel like, <laughs> okay. It's like all these techniques are valid that all the different people are introducing, but like all you guys have mentioned, it's great as like a side dish or it's great as an option, a variant. But to take a side dish and make it the main course, you're losing a lot of the way that, like there is a very simple natural design that we have. And it's that when we're doing anything, we do it as efficiently and effectively as possible. So like you mentioned and having to always go around, that's what I was talking about in the gait assessment is I'm like, can they just move with their hips forward? Because when we're walking, our eyes are in the front of our head for a reason, right? Our chest is open, right? Our body goes in a certain direction. We travel forward most often. So if we're trying to do extra things, that's why I love using the Jesse Owens video from the 1936 Olympics. And you see Jesse Owens, all of his shit is forwards. No wasted motion, no nothing. He's just there. And then you see the other pe people that are struggling behind him. And what are they all displaying? 
they're almost directly displaying the techniques that we're talking about right now. And what are they yeah, doing? Right. Guys like this, and it looks like he's coiling. Another guy's fucking all over the place, like he's doing the Carlton, and the other guy's like digging, <laughs> foot, like Tony's mission. And they all like it's a beautiful yeah. direct comparison to like one, look at this, and then the other one, it's like a host of the peanut gallery of the five different methodologies that we're talking about right now, and they all just pale in comparison. Some things are like you know, people might see my stuff and be like, Oh, that guy just fucking dances and flows around all the time. I do that because it's fun. But I also do that because I've spent my whole life doing the foundational basics that now I get to play with the variables more often because what I'm really fucking good at going forwards that I can go outside and return. But the other people are trying to gather motion data subconsciously. They don't even realize it that something in what they do moving forwards is lacking effectiveness. So then they're trying to go and gather this motion data and they don't even fucking know it. Their instinct is driving them because they need to try and create a fix for something that's not working in them moving forwards efficiently. So then they're just getting trapped in this thing because a lot of people just don't know. So I guess to summarize my point is that we are designed to move forwards and move forwards often and move forwards well. Whenever we're doing something that takes away from that, unless it's personal preference or art or gathering motion data, you will be losing energy and becoming least efficient in the thing that's supposed to be your main course. So if those listening don't make the side of corn the main attraction to the dish that's supposed to be the steak and potatoes. No mashed potatoes for dinner. You don't want that just to be like a... <laughs> I, was, I was picturing a plate of corn myself. That's, uh... I thought mashed potatoes, dude. I thought, like, that doesn't seem like a meal. That just seemed, like, inconvenient. <laughs> uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin lived on raw potatoes in his early wrestling tour days, so... There's a battle for that one. I would love There's to see somebody though. sit down to a full plate of corn. There's a difference <laughs> in making a potato versus making uh, mashed uh, potatoes. <laughs> yeah, like you have to go through a you have to go through a process. I could just put in a a baked potato into you. You get it. You get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put it. I'll be fine. Can of corn. Can of corn. I'll be fine. There you go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> question God. I got for you. For a question I got for you, Ben. Both bands, sure. Um, how much of these systems end up becoming mutated because they need to be replicated? You know what I mean? So like the initial cast of what somebody feels uh, an optimal gate cycle looks like, if they have a bit of their own character in that gate, mm. what's the susceptibility for that movement expression to have that characteristic they're saying, I need to be seen. Mm. I have overcome this injury. Mm -hmm. I am not a small man. I am not injured. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it, what are they overcoming? And how does that come through in the optimization of the gate? Oh, my God, dude. That's so fucking good question. Can we give out gold stars? <laughs> that's a great well, We'll get a sound effect going, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, dude, 100%. A lot of the people, like... They all have similar backstories, right? Not, not many of the ones that are running the systems got to achieve the level of greatness that they envy in some of the people that they coach or use examples. So since they couldn't achieve, like, fuck, let's be realistic. Edo Portal couldn't be good in some sport, so then he just went into generalized movement. Nadi Aguilar wishes he was Jeremy Stevens, right? The dudes that do the go to stuff uh, run marathons. The other guy, I don't know. And then if we just go through them, uh, Weck invented the balance ball or the half BOSU ball or something, but they all gravitate towards sport one, because it's a platform for marketing, but two, they're seeking something that they didn't get to achieve in the social, socially recognized sphere, which is a level competition, right? Sport isn't everything trying to make everyone trying to be a pro athlete. It's not realistic. It's like less than 1% of people can do that stuff, but because they couldn't do it, it's like they're the maybe a uh, child that was looking for more attention. So then what they used, what whatever their medicine was to come to terms with that, as well as try and help those people that they couldn't achieve the thing themselves, like Tony was saying, is it kind of, you always see a trace of the creator and its creation. So they're maybe as a byproduct sharing their medicine with other people without realizing that like, 
that's your medicine. That's your pill that you created. And fucking A, if it works for you, congratulations. Yeah, you made your own tea. You made your own tea with exactly the herbs that you needed to fix your shit. Yeah, that doesn't mean that you mass produce this tea and say, this is the tea now, man. Exactly. (laughs) Fucking A, it's a a one size fits all that doesn't work because if they were to more become like mechanics and realize, hey, this plethora of skills that I've accumulated, I can use to make a custom fit for the person that I'm helping rather than say, hey, my experience works for you verbatim, just copy it. And then when people start blowing out their Achilles and their knees and whatever else, it's just, well, you just didn't have enough tea. Imagine that they have more power than they think they do. That's what's mm-hmm. crazy about this is that, If you have the ability to fix your broken ass self, that Mm. means that you technically have the ability to slow down enough to fix somebody else. Technically speaking. So Mm -hmm. if these guys are really as much uh, of of kings or gurus or whatever they want to call themselves um, with their floating carpets, like (laughs) whatever you want to go at, um, you found a way that worked for you. And if you were, you have all this power and what you've done by saying this is it now is you drew a box around it and you're like never grow and now it's become one of those little cube watermelons that never gets bigger than three inches you had the power and you bottled it mm. why that's yeah. the question that's so, great man. Yeah. a university a, a universality with all these people uh, or these systems you're talking about people who are compounding midline uh, uh, active behavior where it's uh, not reflexive, but it's being uh, conditioned to always be understable. And if the midline is not stable, you don't have a generative output to speak of. But all these people are living in their hands and feet and they're so hypersensitive that they have the ability to make adjustments that most of us can't because they have, like I said, high acuity for their hands and feet because they've built out dependency in those areas. And the more that these people uh, allow for their body to have to fashion constructed thought to create what would otherwise be reflexive action, the more their brain is going to fuel at a cost of the fuel their body should be receiving. Yeah. And you can see that it'll go one of two ways. Either they'll go the triathlete route or the uh, heavy set route. And you can either go, uh, you can get fat from not moving well and uh, not being active or rather not getting the amount of force that would allow for you to brace your pelvic floor. And so the belly will distend and get inflated. Uh and so that would just be not enough force to the top or sorry, the bottom and respective of uh, uh, the other side of things, you can go so far into sympathetics where you consume most of your muscle mass potential, most of your reflexive behavior potential, and you have to cognizantly control everything. And so their body will be very toned and that tone will reflect a cognition or their brain is heavily focused on that area. And so the nerves have been patterned like that, but that tone never changes. That tone never relaxes. And if that tone relaxes, that person has to up-regulate. They have to do something super active or super loud, which is why coaches are loud because they're telling you, hey, I'm loud. I'm really fit. This is how you need to get really fit. When in actuality, (laughs) you have to be aware of how your nervous system consumes fuel and if your brain is always at the behest of how sensitive your nervous system is then you're going to be doing stuff that's going to be seeking behavioral patterns for that presumably and this is going to be a suggestion uh, that i'm happy to contest with these people if they'd like to talk to me about it but WEC has a missing tricep and a fake hip i believe and in that motion pattern his tricep doesn't lever off of his uh, quadricep And that means that his shoulder doesn't rotate properly. So his hip doesn't rotate properly. So when he receives force into the ground or he slaps something with his hand, it goes somewhere that it wouldn't normally go. And so that's why he does a lot of this coiling because without a tricep, 
there's a lot less load you can take on one side and he might be wincing a little. Just a suggestion. Uh, I don't even know the go to guys because he wears knee braces, the Gil guy. And I don't think that you can. He's limping, him. man. Gil be limping. That's all I know. He'd be limping everywhere. He has, yeah, he has like unwell knees. Uh, but the other guy is very uh, uh, skinny, the tall one. I don't really have anything to say about him. I think he played sports, so he was probably fit with it. And then he was uh, coerced with the marketing mechanism because it's really fantastic <laughs> marketing. But one guy and one chick who I see that when they talk, they run out of breath very quickly. And I know that they're more fit than I am because I run out of breath really quickly. But I don't run out of breath when I'm communicating because my belly has the ability to fabricate pressure or tension. I'll run out of breath when I'm running, you know? So yeah. the vast difference is my throat doesn't get tight like I'm trying to push the words out of my face because I no longer have enough stability around my reflexive body to be able to condition that support. Yeah. So fundamentally, it's stress. People don't know how to tolerate stress. They either project it, and so their limbic behavior or their instinct breaks over, and it starts to show up in ways that they mechanize. And so they'll do some stuff where they're tightening up, and so their shoulders will raise all the time, or their hips will pull back a lot because they're, like, scared to, like, deliver force into the whatever it doesn't matter uh, about the thing but our behavior is always a contingency of how we feel and or our brain can express itself so if it cannot express itself properly in a relaxed mechanism maybe don't try to give it more instruction take away some of the things that you're tasking it with and find out how your brain <clears throat> can deal with all the things that are already inside of it as inputs as opposed to everything outside of it becoming those inputs your example of the triathlete overdoing it and like eating all their mass and basically having to run all the controls because everything's exhausted. Yeah. It, the image in my mind was like weekend at Bernie's. I don't know if that's the movie reference that flies, probably flies over. I have seen that one. So, you know, yeah, okay. you're not <laughs> so if you're running this dead body basically is that you've, you've run this thing into the ground and now you're trying to fool everybody into believing that this thing works like weekend at Bernie's and you have to run the whole body. Yeah. <laughs> Exhausting. Totally. Totally. <laughs> so yeah. we, yeah, we touched on most of the stuff that I wanted to get to. Um, I guess what we can finish up on is uh, what are maybe the like ideas that either were presented to you or you kind of came about somehow uh, that like changed your gait or at least changed the awareness of your gait in a way that you felt was like pretty positive for you. Um, one of the first ones for me was just the idea of like creating some sort of like drag back against the ground. Um, nobody had ever really communicated that that was part of what would push me forward. And the minute that somebody um, like suggested that and I was walking around in like the snow, I was like, wow, I actually have a little more like grip on the ground or I'm putting like my imprint on the ground in a different way so that I actually feel less stable. I feel less likely that I'm going to slip out forward. Um, I think that was beneficial. I think you can go too far with just back and miss the down of it all. Um, but that's, that's an example. Uh, ben, is there anything that, that comes to mind to you? Absolutely. Um, this is the, say the positive side of the gate that really had a profound impact on my life, not only in just my training, but me as a person is that if you look at someone in shoes and then on cement, cement has no real ability to absorb force. So it shoots it all back into the joints. So I learned that when you take someone out of shoes and you put them on ground, which automatically stimulus goes up a hundred fold because now you're feeling everything. The nerves in your feet are aware forced to be active, which then activates different parts of your body wholesale. And you also become a lot more aware to where before you don't even realize unless you try it to where when you're walking on cement, you don't think about it. And then like you see it a lot in kids is that they start to get really lazy in the hips and they almost kind of like gumby their legs when they walk and they drag wow. their feet and they just kind of like dangle their legs. It's like their legs are there, but they're not active. And then all of a sudden, like same person, you got them in a gym and in shoes. All right, we got your gait pattern. Take the shoes away, put them on uneven ground and have them walk. You're dealing with a different human being. It's fucking insane. And then you're like, is that actually how they walk then? 
when they don't have the other things and they're forced to be in tune with their environment to where now I'm looking down in the ground because maybe there's a piece of glass or a bug or a rock. Now I have to be actually aware and tuned into my environment versus basically like, a passenger to their own experience walking on even keel ground the brain automatically basically turns off or turns passive when it can predict everything so then things become less active and now all of a sudden people say my back hurts my hips fall in i got organ problems i got all this because what the body's not forced to be active it's basically i can predict exactly what's going to happen when i walk that 200 meters on this perfectly even ground where everything's good and my feet aren't even touching the surface so now i'm a passenger to my emotion so just me spending more time with my shoes off and walking in the grass activated things to a way that like it started just feel things as a byproduct because atrophy started to go away my muscles started to realize hey i have to be active to hold my bones in place because when i walk on here like the way i was walking on cement that hurts and i noticed it so now i need to hug those motherfuckers up and help them groove and then now i'm not a passenger but now i'm the driver of my experience and everything's active so spending time with some shoes off and walking in uneven ground was a uh, monumental for me and i'm going to carry the baton from ben and keep going on the the idea of the sensory input through the feet um shoes on shoes off concrete and earth so um in 20 plus years of refereeing indoor lacrosse in Canada we play on 5,000 psi concrete polished no give um, so let me tell you that these two these two hour games when you're doing stacks of two games sometimes three games it's a lot of pounding at 220 pounds to try and find a running gate that's going to translate into a surface that gives you no energy and takes no energy I'm basically in this container that bounces it back on me right so it's been interesting uh, constantly, still to this day. I constantly manage my footwear for this reason because uh, when you take the time away from, sh from shoes and you go onto uneven surfaces, Ben and I have spent lots of time talking about this from blades of grass to gravel to concrete to asphalt when it's hot. All these different things are going to give you more data to make your feet more intelligent, but mm -hmm. that means you're going to have to manage that new intelligence. So mm -hmm. if you're going to have super sensory organs living on the bottom of your feet, that's fine. But just make sure that you're aware of that when you go and run for two hours, don't jump into minimalist shoes and then mm -hmm. go run on, on 5,000 PSI concrete and expect to have the same output as wearing Nike Pegasus, big cushiony shoes with a 19 millimeter heel and an eight millimeter forefoot. You got a nice wedge that you're running on with a big fat heel strike on a curved treadmill. We're not talking about the same thing. So mm -hmm. when we're talking about adaptability, the other thing that I want to talk about in terms of um, assessment and thinking that we can, we can automate these patterns and we can back engineer them. Uh, one, one word, winter. Go outside <laughs> in winter, motherfucker, and tell me that, that your walking gait is optimal. Get out of here. If it's not slipping on the ice, it's the fact that there are no flat surfaces in winter. In a real frozen winter, there's nothing. Everything is rocky. Your foot is constantly moving around. And as I've said on prior podcasts, the reason I had most of my gym clients go through ankle tilts ad nauseum was because that was the leading cause of their ankle strains. It wasn't playing basketball. It was taking the dog for a walk and, not, and missing a step. It was normal everyday stuff. So when we talk about competency and, and certain positions that are allowed and not allowed, Everything needs to be explored and everything needs to have the red lights turned off so that you can function without getting hurt. We're getting hurt because we're scared of getting hurt. The more don'ts you have running through your cognitive, like your cognizant brain, the more fuckery is going to happen down chain. And then you're going to spend thousands of dollars and thousands of hours trying to figure it out like me. So don't save yourself the trouble, manage your footwear. Okay. If it's uncomfortable, do something about it. If your feet are uncomfortable while you're walking or running, Find appropriate footwear. And if your footwear is wearing out, quit being such a cheap bastard and throw the fucking shoes out. Please. Okay. Like we take the footbeds out of the shoes and the ball, the foot is completely worn through and you're starting to wear through the forefoot and you're like, I don't know what's going on. I have so much pain in my back. It's crazy. So, I mean, there's some certain equipment management stuff that really we don't need to get deep on. Don't use garbage gear. If you can't afford good gear, start leaning towards barefoot activities, but you got to manage your surfaces. It's, a, it's an important factor in this stuff. 
I mean, I've always been super sensory because I imagine there was some issue after hitting my head or some measure of uh, trauma that made it so that the having the input as if uh, maybe I could find some coherence in the noise that was happening in my body. Um, if you can make your body quieter, at least to your brain, while you're doing an effort, uh, you are probably doing a pretty good job of that effort. And I've noticed that the more that I challenge myself to, for example, do something that's balance oriented and not something that's functionally fabricated. So like walking on a, I like the beam walking. I haven't done a whole lot of it, but like walking on something that is round or cylindrical and I don't know, a couple feet long and one foot out of the other or tight roping or whatever that is, what people do between trees Slacklining. Um, yeah, yeah, slacklining. Um, those types of things condition walking uh, in the line of your midline or walking around your midline as opposed to moving your midline so as to fabricate the rotation. And so there's a lot more inhibitory action or like uh, uh, Ben it, um, like the energetic resistance, the opposing force. You action way more opposing force relative to the force that you're relative to balance not just opposing for prefabricate so as to get into the perfect position undulation or the gyroscope or whatever people want to refer to as like the adjustment to your brain letting everything settle and then finding it's like most available position and oftentimes we just don't have a lot of muscle built out in the area so if you stand with neutral feet or sorry narrow feet either feet in front of each other uh, or like walk with narrow feet, feet in front of each other, like you're a tightrope walker, or you do some like standing on a rock or standing on something that's rounded that allows your feet to curve to it. There'll be some experience of standing through your hips a little bit more and your pelvis. And that will allow for someone to understand how it is to put weight downward as opposed to expect for weight to be forward or weight to come backward. And so if people can root like a tree, grounding your feet or your toes are your roots and you don't want to grip with your roots you want to spread with your roots because you're not you don't have a grasp you only have a potentiation to grow through stuff so as best you can try to grow through space don't try to take up space that you're already or sorry don't try to uh, hold on to and or grip things with your hands and feet no that's in and up gripping with your hands and feet is in and up Right. That's yeah. a, it's a, it's a, it, it's not a it's sympathetic behavior. Grabbing with your hands and feet is sending a signal that I don't entirely trust where I'm at. Pending signal yeah. pending. You know what right. I mean? Like, especially when everything else is relaxed, but your hands and feet are still tight. It's like it's a oh, very confusing signal. This was always my my game. I didn't even realize how much I. Had, so when I. I've always been hyper stimulated to the point where I didn't realize there was a degree of me that I thought was, I thought I was part autistic or part autistic. I don't think you can come. Pardon me. <laughs> we can clip that out. Excuse uh, me. No, that's welcome one. to stay in there. That's welcome to uh, stay. In. I thought that I was, I thought I was autistic or I had degree of some, um, uh, non-neurotypical or neurodivergent behavior that was restricting my ability to process information the same way as everyone else until I realized that it was a byproduct of stress trauma or like head injury and like I couldn't move my eye fully around and then when it started to move to its full scope I could start to move around or feel parts of my head that I couldn't prior and then when I started to realize that there was points of my head that was were always active or racing literally like my hands while they were always gripped my head was doing that around my eyeballs around my ears uh where i didn't know that i was having migraines all the time or that was what migraines were i just thought that hey life sucks <laughs> yeah, really. and it, i was really hyper stimulated so until recently until it started to slow down and i started to take into account yes i'm highly sensitive and so i can do stuff that most people cannot quicker than they can because I've built out a propensity to be sympathetic for more time than most people. It doesn't tailor into me being relaxed and responding uh, coordinatedly in relax. And so being able to like 
be happy and friendly and comfortable with a group of friends when I'm not also looking around my shoulders for whatever reason, because my eye needs to move around and it doesn't know how to fully move around or uh, I'm apprehensive about someone uh, coming home or whatever it may be. Like there's always a propensity to carry with you trauma that you didn't figure out and you'll always be wearing it. I think it's called subscara, which is like scars underneath the surface, scars that you keep with you. So like, uh, the trauma that we retain. And most of us are sponges for it. We always remember the painful things and coordinate our personalities off the painful things, as opposed to trying to condition that like things better and can continue to be better if I have the allowance or permission to receive new stimulus or new force without whatever, letting it go. Yeah, and, and dealing with those is probably the, the better way to go about changing your gait cycle, changing the way that you express yourself is that you can express a, a version of yourself that is like dealt with some stuff um, who's coming out on the other side of thing versus a version of yourself who is chasing the optimal form. Um, all right, guys, we'll wrap up there. Thanks for hanging on the monkey bars with me. We'll see you next time. I like that outro. <laughs>